little bit to that terminology. However, with that said, there are certainly principles that we don't have time to talk about in the normal spotter training class. How many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you have been to spotter training within the last few years? Yeah, I get, I get the majority of hands. Okay. Um, the people that you were talking about maybe going out and spotting, hopefully everybody has not only been to spotter training, but the person sitting next to them in the vehicle or at their house has also been through spotter training. Okay. I think that's an important consideration. We go to spotter training, we talk about small lines, we talk about the supercells. Okay, we talk about where the updraft is, where the downdraft is. We talk about, because of that, identifying where the updraft is, is gives you a chance to see the tornado. Downdraft, see the damaging winds. In between the hail. From there, what information do you need to go back to those two pillars? To spot safely, and then be able to report it. Becomes a challenge when it comes to this concept of advanced spotting. There's a lot more material out there that allows you to increase your knowledge. And I will say this, if you go to online, do Google on Comet, C-O-M-E-T, and then MetEd, M-E-T-E-D, the number one class you're going to find is the normal spotter training class. Um, they do an excellent job. Some material there is very, very good. But when you go beyond that, now you start getting the advanced meteorological training. I think it's very good material for net controllers. But what do you need to become a better spot? That's that's a couple of topics that I'm going to just pull out of maybe a multitude of topics that we can talk about. But the two topics that I chose to talk about here this evening, I want to talk a little bit more about tornado movement, and I want to talk a little bit about non non traditional signatures. And I think you'll see what I, I what I mean by that here very shortly. Ultimately, what do you need to know to become a better spot? Let me throw that out. Situation one. Okay. You do a very good job of reminding me. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of different possibility, possible answers I was going to get from everybody, but that was the one I was going to come back to. Okay? Situational awareness is your knowledge and your experience combined with the facts that are going on around you that allows you to project to the future what's going to happen next. And we all do a very fine job formulating an opinion on what we think is going to happen next. Sometimes we stop right there. As a net controller, can you stop right there? What's going to happen if you're communicating the information off to people in the field and you don't look, ever look at radar during the course of a two-hour event? You can put some people in harm's way. Okay? The communication's not going to be as good as it possibly can be. Okay? Situational awareness, I think, is, is, is a topic that we've tried to really highlight the last decade or so. And I think we're getting it. I think there's a, there's a lot of evidence that this is paying off. For starters, I don't know of a ham here in southwest Missouri that's gotten run over by a tornado. Is that a situational awareness issue? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the safety side. The communication side, you mentioned just two or three clubs there, different repeaters, different net controllers. I don't know. How many, how many nets do we have out there during an average severe weather event? Multiple. Okay. And I, at the weather service, can pretty confidently say we're getting those reports in. And that's again, I'm going to go back to Jim Sellers. I'm going to get a confidence there. He's the one, he's our ringleader. He's, he, yeah, I give him a little bit of guidance, but ultimately he's the one who makes it happen. And I do appreciate everything you guys have done and helped in that regard. But ultimately, by him being able to work with everybody, increases everybody else's situation. So, but I'll just, just kind of touch upon those two topics. So let's talk about situation awareness as it relates to, first off, tornado movement. <coughs> what controls the direction tornadoes move? When here. Wind? Can I hear someone say wind? Okay, excellent. History? Jet stream. Jet stream. Okay, so, okay, okay. Kind of go back to the wind thing. Okay. Can I say buoyancy? <laughs> Would it be. Shear? Okay. Would it be fair to say tornado strength? Because the stronger ones. One of the key topics that we're going to talk about is how those two things, tornado strength, 
and the, the, the wind shear, and more importantly, the pressure gradient of those two things, how they interact to, to move the tornado in a certain direction. Anything else? In a related subject, the temperature difference. Okay. Moisture. Moisture. I was going to say moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. Where's Steve Palmer sitting? <laughs> <laughs> you can pass, let me know where he's at at all times. <laughs> This is a few that I kind of keep up with. We're going to touch a little bit on some of these more so than others, but just kind of let you know that when you start hearing things come out of the Storm Prediction Center, you start to apply your knowledge to the facts at hand. They probably relate to several of these things, even though, for the most part, what we're doing, show that quite yet. What we're doing is we're pulling on the radar. And we're determining it was there 15 minutes ago, and it's now here, and we're going to connect the dots and project it to go this direction. Well, does it really boil down to that for most people? That's the we work at radar. Okay? Now, there's some things that go into the situation where the environment has some knowns that might change that, that propagation. All right? And that's where I want you to think, especially as net control. But more importantly, if you are a spotter, whether it be from your house or if you're a mobile spotter, there are some things that change the direction the tornadoes will move. Okay? Ultimately, any tornado is just simply an updraft associated with that supercell, that small line, or that non traditional stuff. Okay? So wherever the updraft is, is where that tornado can be. It might be a little bit of an offshoot of that main updraft, but the buoyancy within that part of the storm, that geography, that, that location, is going to lead to that rotating updraft. Okay. There are some things in the literature that talks about outflow from the thunderstorm that actually pushes the updraft. I can buy that. I mean, if you look at the number of, of tornadoes that kind of do this, there are some things at play in terms of the rainy downdraft, pushing it. But more importantly, the rear flank downdraft. And if I were really to look at all of these things, this is perhaps the thing that we're going to be able to utilize spotters to try to determine is something different going on within that supercell that's going to control where that tornado tracks. This last one, though. This is a big, okay? and I'm not going to get too complex. This will probably be like a 300 level course. But when it comes down to it, there are some tools available on the Storm Prediction Center's page, and some, some very good apps out there, that do give you an indication when these so-called pressure gradient forces are going to come into play and cause a tornado not to move straight, but instead turn to the right. The RFD cutting off the updraft will cause it to curve to the left. The pressure radiance will cause it to turn to the right. Okay. Are these important things to stop? Especially the turn to the right? <laughs> okay. So I, I think, again, these, these are not necessarily going to be taught from an advanced level, but they are topics that we should talk about every year when we do spot training, but we don't have time to talk about. All right. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about this. We do know that these things turn to the left and turn to the right, right? Okay. Uh, look at the uh, battlefield Pier City, Pier City Valley. Look at the number of jobs that it made as it moved heavily up Highway 6. Look at job. What's the direction I typically tell you in spotter training to get? Looking to the northwest, right? Alright. So if I'm down here, hmm, looking to the northwest, <laughs> If I don't know that storm's change directions, no problem. Okay. All right. Now we try to do this with the right-handed rule. Remember, wherever the rainy downdraft is, is generally the direction that the tornado's going to move. There's some generalities there, but if I can follow that rainy downdraft, I know that that tornado's going to 
change direction from detection and move to my location. Very important consideration. Kind of a basic level idea, but ultimately it is one that we do try to get people into people's decision making toolbox. The other thing we try to do is, of course, the updraft, downdraft area fitting within your windshield such that you know the direction is going to move. Could I have been surprised by the job on tornado if all of those things would be? I want to utilize that. Okay. So I want to go a little bit beyond those two simple tools that I've tried to tell you over the last couple of years. Let's start with the supercell. Now, again, the rainy downdraft along the leading edge is, is the, the downdraft that we talk about with spotter training, but there is an even more critical one that occurs at the back end, the rear front downdraft. If my tornado does touch down, it's going to be guided much like Brian said, by the upper level winds, it's going to push the top of the storm, the so-called cloud-bearing winds. It's going to push the storm in a certain direction, and because of that, the rain is going to typically be just downstream from the corner. It might be a little bit too north, but it gives you the general location of where the tornado comes down. So the tornado touches down. As part of that tornado genesis, there's an interaction with the rear flight down there. Some of that is known, some of it's unknown. We know, for example, a temperature dew point that is close to each other will typically lead to the tornado, but if the temperature dew point within that rear point downdraft is great, two things will occur. Number one, the tornado is not going to touch down. Or number two, if it does touch down, this thing acts like a cold front, and it moves quite vigorously, quite fast, cuts off the inflow, which is the lifeblood of that plant updraft. So, there's a lot of things within this RFP that is pretty darn important. Okay? It's pretty important to us at the Weather Service. And I'd love to be able to talk at length, but sometimes we have, in spot training, we've given this indication. Yeah, you got the rainy downdraft off the right, you got the tornado here. Guys, look to the left. Look at this clearing. Like a big uh, hand has scooped out that moisture. What else happened is actually descending motion is causing that. If you can get set up where you can not only see the rainy downdraft, the updraft, and the arc, now your situational awareness should be going on. Okay. Another shot from a different angle. Okay. Again, we usually key in on <coughs> this part of the storm, right? One of the other reasons why I like you to get southwest or southeast looking to the northwest is actually so you can see underneath the wall cloud, partly because of the rear front downdraft clearing skies on the back side of the storm. So if the tornado does occur, I can see the silhouette against the clearing skies on the back side of the storm. So the rear front downdraft has some pretty important principles when it comes to tornado genesis. Because how does that wrap into the updraft? It's important how that tornado touches down, but it will also get cut off the inflow. So if this hole there wraps to the east and to the south, it stops more moist air from blowing up into that storm. Again, like a cold front to the east and to the south, cuts off the inflow of that energy. Tornado touches down, here's the rear front down there. Over time, the rear front downdraft moves east, cuts off the inflow, which causes that tornado to want to curl to the north in search of warm moist air. If it doesn't find that warm moist air, it dissipates. And here's the neat thing. You know, we've had some chance to talk about the influence of the RFD on spotter training, but what we talked about is solely to the fact that as that rear flank downdraft moves to the east, it sets up a new area of rotation to the second tornado, or a third tornado, or a ten. Something that we haven't had too often during those arcs are tornado families. The same supercell producing multiple tornadoes. And you talked a lot about Jonathan. We had some folks from Saddlebrook in the office just the other day. And that supercell produced a top of tornado, produced a tornado in the saddle, but very little. 
Okay, so the rift like downdraft again is a is, is a very important factor when it comes to forming a tornado, dissipating the tornado, but then potentially increasing the number of tornadoes. The important thing to a spotter, and this is again something I probably wouldn't ask net controls forward to us, but if a spotter were out in there, out in the field, saying the rift like downdraft just cut across my location. I felt the wind shift from the south to the west. The tornado, however, remains undeterred. It's still on the ground. Well, wait a minute. Maybe the tornado is still on the ground, but it's turning away from me. It's turning to the north. That's pretty valuable information to us, because immediately we would want spiders to be looking off the east from the next tornado touching down. So change the movement of tornado A, but more importantly, the possibility of tornado B. Is that an important safety? That's one area. Let's consider the Green, Greensburg, Kansas EF5. Well, we know it, 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 it hit Greensburg and, and it caused too many fatalities. It caused the, the destruction of virtually the entire city. Uh, don't, the, don't the turn to the left. It'll really be the Right? The RFD cuts off, storm tries to find warm moist air, doesn't, the aircraft gets cut off in this case. But then we had another tornado, no curve to the left, curve to the left, curve to the left, or each subject. I'm not going to say you're always going to get this. But if the RFD does cut off the inflow in such a way that the supercell is able to survive, but the original updraft gets cut off, our storm is going to. Dissipate. Now, going back to this idea of pressure gradient forces. This is very important when it comes to storms like Joplin. Storms that have an immense amount of updraft and a lot of wind shear. And we know these two things come together for the formation of organized storms, number one. But more importantly, these are the two factors that lead to supercell development. Storms have their rotating up there. Okay? Just real quick primer. If you take a balloon and raise it through the environment, we have an idea of what the temperature is, what the dew point is, what the uh, wind direction and wind speed is. The surface up to 100,000 feet. We do that twice a day in the weather series. We have about 100 locations, including here in Springfield. The red is the temperature. The green is the dew point, and then this provides an indication of the, the lifted parcel of air. Okay? The greater the, the area, the instability is indicated as that parcel rises. The easiest way I can describe this, if you take a hot air balloon, you turn on the burner, what happens to that balloon? It goes up. The longer you leave that burner on, the warmer the air within that balloon is, and if you compare the temperature of that rising hot air balloon to the temperature of the air around it, the greater that difference is the greater the instability at that layer. At 500 millibars, you'll see a, a, is a, is a term meteorologists will use quite a bit, the so-called lifted index. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area where if you have a minus 5, you have pretty unstable conditions. If you have a minus 10, that's pretty darn unstable. If you put, they go to minus 15, it's pretty damn unstable. Okay, But that's just that one layer. One of the things that we are very concerned about is not what's just going on at the surface, but as you go along, what is every single one of these layers, the instability within that, that will control the rate of lift of that air pressure. Okay? That's one thing. Second thing, just like with that balloon, determining what the temperature and the dew point is, we also take a look at the wind direction and wind speed. And we can plot that on, on a, as a so-called photograph. Take a look at the wind direction and wind speed. You can plot it on this chart, and if you start to consider the days in which we get violent tornadoes, the cyclical appearance, the cyclic appearance, I should say, is often noted. If you look at job and look at many others, you'll see this big curving profile. During spider tail training, we just simply talk about southeast winds of the surface going around the south and the southwest and finally around the west. 
south of the surface, then around the southwest, finally around the west. But it's this, this observation that leads to a sense of expectation for the development of the supercell that we generally stop right there. <coughs> Guys, one of the considerations that I want to, I want to give to you is there's more to it. And I'm not going to get fully into this subject other than saying if you have an updraft, a very strong updraft, a lot of instability, in which air is rotating, my greatest speed of ascent is going to be a law than it is at the surface. But my updraft is going to get stretched. It's going to get turned and stretched. So consequently, the inflow is going to increase. What will you it's pretty well understood that there's still a little bit of questions. What we've noticed is, is that it's these types of supercells that are producing strong and kind of violent tornadoes are the ones that are responding to this pressure gradient force within the middle levels of that supercell that are turning to the left. And if you have a certain photograph or, or something called storm relative velocity, a knowledge of those things, and it's all from old balloons, it's all available every day, in small predictions on your site, among many others. You can start to say to yourself, hey, is that storm going to turn to the right? I would really love my net controllers to know that this phenomenon exists, such that it's not just the radar propagation, but they're anticipating the turn to the right. Let's go back to Joplin just a second. I'll make sure I don't mind being ahead of myself here. I am. Okay. Um, I'm talking too long. Um, if you look at the Joplin day, I don't have the polygons with me, that area in which the warning is in effect for. But let's imagine out of southeast Kansas into the northern part of Jasper County, because that's the direction the cells were moved. Now that particular warning didn't pan out. The storm was rotating, it, it merged with the storm to the south, and it caused the Joplin. Uh, tornado ultimately to form part of the south. What was the orientation? What was the direction of that southern polygon? Was it also the north? north? I should say northeast? It was more east and actually east-southeast. What direction did it, did it go after it hit rain time? Turned to east-southeast. So knowledge of those things, storm relative humidity, I'm oh, sorry, storm relative velocity, and ultimately, knowledge of photographs, I think, are fantastic things for our net controls to know about. Okay, go back to Comet, MedEd, and you can get some additional training. Again, this is not training for spotters. This is meteorological advanced training. Okay? It doesn't hurt a spotter to know these things, but ultimately, it does, I think, help our net controls to have a better feel for the direction that's going to be. Okay? All right. Now, I got... I, I, I want to look at El Reno. Okay? Joplin had the fish. El Reno had the eel or the seal. Alright? It turned rather vigorously to the left. And then to the right. And then to the left. And then to the right before dissipating. Okay? Some of you have seen this, this presentation. We threw a couple segments in there uh, the year after it had occurred. Okay, and then Joplin kind of cut away, and we, we ended up talking more about Joplin, etc. This is the case, if you recall, that Storm Chasers got killed. Okay, and we also had a gentleman on his very first Storm Chase. We had very experienced Storm Chasers, and we had a gentleman who had never chased before. Okay? By my reckoning, it really doesn't know your level matter, your level of knowledge when it comes to being in this situation if you don't recognize the situation you're in, situational awareness. Okay? You if you get too close, it doesn't matter the type of information that's at your disposal, you could very well make a bad decision and not recognize just how dangerous the situation you're in. Why well, I want to keep you in the south. Allow you to have a, a, an escape route. Okay? Um, I don't think I'm going to, I'm going to take the time in order, in order to go into this whole graph. But again, here's that curvature I talked about earlier. So if you see this curvature, it's an indication of low-level winds going from southeast around the west. Okay? 
Now, if, you, if you combine that with Joplin, now you start talking about a situation where the net control <coughs> might be doing a better job anticipating that storm changing direction. Okay? Now, I'm going to play through a couple film clips. Uh, I don't know the back to room. We might want to turn off the lights to make this a little easier to see or not. But I want to describe a couple things. These are all chasers. All these dots. Okay? And they're going to move over time. The author of this presentation plotted these guys in reference to the radar, but also added the general storm track, tornado track. Okay? So I want to show you this as it relates to maybe something that you at some point in the future, might find yourself a little too close. Okay. Um, it's got audio. My, 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 my laptop isn't really fantastic. So if there is something that to maybe highlight, I'm going to speak over the audio. Otherwise, we'll try to let, let, let it explain itself and what's going on. set the stage. Some of the things that you may have heard on the tape, you know, these guys got southeast, they looked to the northwest. This was a, a, a partially rain-wrapped tornado, but a very large tornado. This is, this is a situation where the instability was huge, so there's a lot of upward vertical motion, there's a fair amount of, of moisture in the atmosphere, so it was pretty dark, a lot of rain, didn't really hit nearly as much as what Joplin did, so there was not as much debris in the air. Um, but the, the, the chasers slash spotters who were looking at the storm were generally in the right spot. Would you agree with that? You know, they were, they were down here in the southeast looking to the northwest. Rain to the right, updraft to the left. But the storm was not following that. The upper level winds were actually a little bit more southeastern. <coughs> They made a remark about the width of the tornado. At one point in here, it was 2.6 miles long. Now, i got to be honest. There was an event up in up in Nebraska, if you would call it, Boy Scout Camp, so we just go build a couple of Boy Scouts. There was a very respected WCM at that location that rated that tornado about a mile and a half wide, and I really had a look at him. This, this guy worked with Vegeta directly. He, he knows his stuff. And when he said a mile and a half wide, I'm like, yeah, really? 2.6 miles? I'm like, come on. Look at this is this is the, this is the tornado mecca of the world. These guys know what they're talking about. I think in one one real uh, uh, 
realization here, the wall cloud almost came down to the ground. Okay, so how wide do wall clouds get? Three to five miles, maybe. You know, they're, they're fairly wide. Traditionally, the tornado is, is a very small area of that wall cloud. So you got this huge thing coming down to the ground. This was also multiple vortex tornado. You heard him talk about that. So as you've got this, this broad rotation, you get these little spinny things that are going on underneath it. If you key in on this little spinny thing and not everything that's going on around you, can you pop by, get pop by surprise? Okay. All right. But again, what we saw in some cases is these guys moving east or maybe trying to come down from the north to the south, pretty much that is. Okay, you recall that. But ultimately, were they trying to figure out the direction the storm was going, or were they trying to get in a position to see it? It's two different things. And I want our spotters to keep safety in mind at all times. So as our net controllers in the room and, and elsewhere across southwest Missouri, we definitely want them to be paying attention to the radar. We want to hear some indications from our spotters over what is the direction that tornado is going. One of the spookiest videos from Joplin. There was a, uh, uh, a foreign film crew that was coming from the north, I'm sorry, yeah, from the north to the south on range line, just, just east of the tornado. They knew it was there. They had pictures off to the, uh, their cameras off to the right, but you couldn't see it. You saw this black mass. Okay? Uh, they, the reason why it's spooky is they know it's there. They come up to, I don't know, like 26. Second, 26, 26, I guess it is. And they, one of them says, hey, there's a Home Depot. Should we take shelter? <laughs> no. okay. But it gets better. They get to I-4, they go south to I-44, and they turn east. <laughs> they turn east to try to get in position again to catch up to it. Now, I don't know what happened in that game. I know they weren't hit by it. But if you remember, the tornado turned to the right across I-44. Guys, I don't want this type of video to be recreated at some point far from Springfield, Missouri, showing more spotters in this area. This took the size, didn't anticipate the turn, and ultimately got run over by the tornado. Okay? Call it advanced spotting or otherwise, we've got to recognize when an environment is conducive for a storm to turn to the right or a storm to turn to the left. Okay? Um, I want to show you one more video of this series. This one's neat. I really like this one because it's going to show you what the spotter is, is, is seeing cloud formation wise while at the same time showing his location and reference to the radar as well as the tornado track. And he also and he, he shows you how he gets out ahead of it and he stays out ahead. Okay, pretty important stuff. Yeah, I apologize for the sound. I, I should have brought speaking with me. I just quite off the guy. So he's going north. The supercells, well, really, this whole complex of cells, but the tornado's going to form down here. So he's going to the north. He's looking to the west. This is the down graph associated with this part of the storm. know this is where the tornado is going to come out of, but he's trying to get south to get to this clear area that you can see over here. He's right here right now, jogging a little bit, but trying to ultimately get well out ahead of the east and to the south. Now at this point in time, this is a good idea. You know, some of you are mobile guys, some of you are stationary guys. I would love for you to know what is developing? Radar, I think, is a terrific tool to help you make these decisions. 
Still going south. Tornado's yet to touch down. But he is going across the path. A ventral path. He's heading back to the west. Is this an unusual? I mean, he's still a couple miles away from it. Tornado's yet to touch down. What's this dust right here? We just got done talking about it. Rear flank down there? So he's now pointing back to the northwest. So again, this is the traditional. Rain to the right, updraft to the left. Rain to the right, updraft to the left. Tornadoes on the ground. Anybody see it? Yeah. Honestly, I don't. Windshield test, remember to talk about the spotter training? Do you clearly know where the updraft is and downdraft? No. No, obviously, how you can see it. Right, right. <laughs> now, he did start to get some indication that right at the very end, when the new updrafts were going up, when the airflow was coming up to the south and going vertical, again, that's something that we do want to entertain good spotter training. We do want spotters to be able to identify where the updraft is, not just when the tornado. But by the upward vertical motion that you're seeing, you're witnessing, and in reference to where the downdraft is. But, but in this case, if he was three to five miles to the south and staying three to five miles to the south, he wouldn't have put himself in that dangerous pitch position. Now, he was one of the lucky ones. He did get run over. He recognized that what was after. He, well, no, wait a minute. I'm back up. He initially set up farther to the east and the south than anybody else. Okay, he didn't want the. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't drive into the storm. He got in a position to let the storm come to him, which allowed him to stay east and avoid it. Okay? Net control can, can buoy what it is that, that they, the spotter thinks they're saying or seeing. So it's an interaction between those two entities that allows them to stay on top of it. Can the net control talk directly to one spotter the entire time? Well, they're doing our things, right? Okay. So this is something the spotter does have to recognize. I think the net control and interacting with the weather service can, can, can do a good job, but it is something we need to work probably better on. And the fact that we even had too many traumatic supercells that stayed on the ground for a long <coughs> period, we need we need some storms to get back and to, to speed it. Okay. 
Alright, that's one topic I, I wanted to talk about. The second talk, the topic I want to talk about is non-traditional tornadoes. You know, we got a pretty good feel for what a supercell looks like and, 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 and that's because the Mother Nature tips her hand, she shows us the rotation aspect of it, whether it be in the hook, haircut sign, that leads to rotation that we can pretty easily say, hey, that's where the tornado's at. The well, supercells are actually pretty easy. The environment is pretty apparent. On radar, reflectivity, velocities are pretty apparent. We have a pretty good feel for what's going on. Non-supercell tornadoes ain't the case. Much, much more difficult. We started noticing some of the environmental clues with the wind shear over a a certain uh, layer of the atmosphere is, but the strength of that wind is, it allows us to get a feel for when are the super, when are, where are the, the squall lines going to produce tornadoes. Some of the radar, the, the radar structures, oh boy, you're going to leave here today, I think, just amazed that some of these storms produce tornadoes. And I showed you some of the more easier ones. Okay? Horatio, big windstorm, right? Okay? Big squall line went from a nice straight line on July the 4th to this bowed out section. Now we see something like this on radar, what are we going to think? What's the threat? Wind, right? Wind all along the apex of that <coughs> squall line coming up. But if we're paying attention to this outflow boundary, which increases spin, and then you have a new updraft on the leading edge, the spin combined with the Vertical motion, that's just like a supercell, stretch, and you got to put spin up on it. We also notice this convection on the head on the end of this area of the outfall line. Pretty soon a tornado is getting ready to touch that. Okay, so, small lines, we talk about spider training as being high wind producers. They can, however, produce tornadoes. Some of the signatures that I want to try to roll with this evening are hopefully going to be recognizable by net controls, by spotters looking at radar, to try to figure out how in the world we issue the tornado warning when it's a squall line. Okay? For starters, when it comes to um, downburst induced squall lines, there are two areas in particular I'm going to be concerned with. This area on the north side. There's one area in particular. And then at the very south end is another. So you got within the comma head, and then you have a so-called tail end trout. A vocabulary. Okay? Then you've got these creatures that aren't really squall lines, and they're not really just clustered <laughs> cells. There's some degree of organization about them. If you, if you read our forecast discussion, you look at the Storm Prediction Center material, they will refer to quasi-linear convective systems. Group cells, multi-clusters of cells, but ultimately how these cells appear might be providing you some indication of where a potential tornado is going to develop, but they're not a very clear-cut look. Okay? As an example, some of the things I want to go over real quick, and I just spent a lot of time on these things, but um, um, rear inflow notches, the forward inflow notches. Where these two things come together is where you can infer a degree of rotation. Storm surges, basically this part of the storm jutting out open to the east. Uh, contracting bookend in this area here, as we talk about the con ahead and social with the squall line. So let's just kind of go through some of these cells. Go ahead. Some of these cells as an indication of maybe times when we're not anticipating a tornado, but all of a sudden you get a tornado warning from the weather service. Okay? Again, here's the note. I know it looks like a mini supercell. But it's within other cells mixed around it. So it's not a true discrete cell, but it kind of has this degree of appearance to it. 
as this little nub, this, this, this area of uh, precipitation here, moves up the line. Does this look similar here and here? Okay. Again, not a traditional appearance. Something that we would normally expect a, a tornado to form. Okay. Now this one, you could make this out to be a nub, or is this a tail end chart or a supercell? Is it a supercell embedded within a squall? I don't know. I do know it will produce a tornado. Okay. I do know, looking at reflectivity alone, would give you much of an indication. This one is considered velocity. Look at the rotation. Not just at the point five, you look a little higher in the atmosphere. The, the, the note disappears, but the rotation remains. Okay, so we see one of these nubs, look at the rotation on the, the velocities. We give a pretty good indication. What are we thinking? At the same time you're seeing maybe some of these nubs, you might start to notice these, these areas of precipitation starting to diminish on the back side of the squall. Maybe even go rain free. Look at the losses along this shear zone, extending all the way through the squall line, where couples start to form. You're like that to this, and then you can start to say, oh, wait a minute, maybe that is one of these nodes. Or maybe it's an interaction from the rear end flow and the forward point end flow, both coming together leading to a point. <clears throat> the surge I talked about, let's kind of go back and forth here. We've got a rather area of heavy rain. Maybe some hail. The bow echo really doesn't look too prominent, but if you consider the velocities, it's jutting out much faster than what the reflectivity might suggest. And indeed, you kind of go back and restore time wise here. This is 1038. Oh, by the way, it's 1038Z. What time is that? Considering this is April 27th. 5.38. 5.38 in the morning. Okay. Got a rather nondescript cell. Maybe a bulb which could be the severe thunderstorm morning. Between 10.38 and 10.52, this part of the cell surged out. Okay. We'll go back and forth up that. Okay. And as it flowed outward, you notice the circulation increases. So these strong surges is another area where we potentially see some rapid updrafts, rotation, and walk up to it. Yeah, you looked at this, and you think it's kind of you know, Ron Hurst breaks in the, on, on TV at 5.38 in the morning. I'll tell you, the tornado warning is up there. You slip and look at the screen and say, I don't know. Another consideration for all of this, all of these, these phenomena are strong updrafts. Okay? Let's look at a four panel of the same cell. Okay? So this area at the surface, a little bit aloft, a little higher aloft, and still higher. This area here is directly over. This opening up here. And so you've got, you got a very strong updraft on the leading edge of the squall line. Okay. That's all I got there. But also, in this case, we've got another one. What would you like to try to have open? Depending upon the type of finale that, that, that I'm showing you here, sometimes they go up the line. Sometimes they are moving east ahead of it. But more often than not, with these non quasi uh, conductive linear systems, they're actually moving into the squall. So they get generated out ahead, 
And then they moved up into the swamp, walked up the line. Uh, no, no, there's a question is, is, it, is it moving to the north while at the same time the squall line is moving to the east, Whoa. or is there a phenomenon in which they're being sucked into that squall line? But it's, well, an, it's an infection thing as opposed to a movement. So that's kind of one of those instances where instead of the general line, you have to use the as it's relative to the line of storms, it's coming this way, but, but relative to the actual track of the tornado, it's moving north while the squall line is moving south. That's what you do. That's what we do. Because you've got to tell. How about this one? How, you know, if you look at reflectivity alone, any indication of tornado? Considering lost. Okay. Remember that, that bow echo I showed you way, way back when? This area here? Now it's correlated. What's going on? Okay. So these are things that we're looking at the, at the office. We've got NWS chat. We've got our, our, our net controllers hopefully on chat. We certainly have got the media on chat. Ultimately, we are trying to let you know why we've just issued this tornado warning. When it doesn't look like a supercell, but part of the challenge with these QLCS tornadoes is they, they touch down in a very ambiguous looking environment. They stay on the ground a few minutes, typically. They lift, they dissipate. But once we know the environment is set for that type of storm, we'll end up getting several of these types of phenomena. Here's one from Webster Company. Back in 2009, 13.53, so what time? 8.53 in the morning, you've got five hours. Okay. We have an indication something is pushing this off the east, maybe something coming in from the east, so you've got some degree of convergence here, rotation of nothing else. I'll put the tornado on the ground. While this might be a little bit ambiguous, yeah, dates of big rotation. And to go off again, it's got some depth to it. Back up. This is Franklin. Put that out here. Public road is about here. Hey, okay, living there. Okay. Who's going to try a warning for this? Are you going to you know, you slip and turn on Kevin Whitey and kind of look? Now, this is after dark. Yeah, this is another case where it's after dark. You look outside and all of a sudden your shed goes. <laughs> Let's say, what, just for the sake of argument, you say, you are able to see enough to say that's a tornado as opposed to straight line. Let's say you have the wherewithal to get out your radio, you've got a net control who's working in that, or you get through to us at the running service. You just told us that there's been a tornado. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> if it tells you that, or I'm going to tell you at the running service. Well, let's take a look at reflectivity. I'm sorry, velocity rise. Okay. This is right where you live. <laughs> look at this, look at this, look at that. Now, that's not a that thunderstorm. So it goes this thing, off of the public road, the same guy, mostly, basically, basically. Guys, I I don't know what the, the, the ultimately, and I think I'm going to stop there with that one. And I, actually, I am going to give you a few more of these. I don't know what the answer is as far as should these be tornado worn cells. Our challenge is that, yes, we're noticing these rotations. We have a feel for the environment necessary for them to form in. Our tool that we tell the public is a rotating column of air in contact with the ground means a tornado, so therefore it has to be a tornado warning. 
The challenge that we have for emergency management, that we have for, for you all, is how to say this cell right here associated with that rotation does the initial function. Here's another one, poke down. How do we convey this message? I don't know. Okay. But I'll tell you this, we're getting a better feel for the environment. We've got some, some terrific guys at the Weather Service who are, doing, who are doing some local research that allows us to get a better feel for which cells, which environments, what days are going to lead to this type of phenomenon. But we still got to communicate to get people to respond. And one of the things that we've heard from Joplin, this is a supercell baby, you know, which again, the media can get on and show the big hook echo, show you the polygon, and we think that would be enough for the reaction to lead to a, to a to people going to go to the basement or storm shelter. This ain't what we're talking about here. This is a very ambiguous looking environment. Maybe we're forecasting a squall line or at least storms producing high winds. And all of a sudden we start to issue tornado winds. How do we convey that? Go back to Joplin. Joplin said it wasn't just the hook echo or other tornado warnings, it was the confirmation that people were using to move shelter. I think in all these ambiguous cases, if one of you all were underneath that rotation and told us our mobile home just got overturned, the windows of the elementary school across the street were just blown out. If that information gets to the media, and ultimately people hear about it, and take shelter, even though it doesn't look like this big red rotating blob that we normally think of as a supercell, we trained uh, the media, they have the signature in mind, and by the way, I do want to give each one of these copies. It's basically stuff that we gave them. This is stuff that we have under glass at the, at the office. This is cutting edge stuff. This is stuff that we have to deal with. In fact, we get more QLCS related tornadoes than we get supercell related tornadoes. So how can I get information to the net controls in a timely manner before the storm system develops. And then ultimately, how can they get information to you all to convince you to start looking outside on days in which Dr. Greg Forbes is not putting a torque count of eight over. So how do we raise your situation awareness to the point, even though it doesn't look like supercells, or you don't right now see the rotation, but how do you start to recognize the threat exists such that you are willing to start watching the sky. If you're a mobile spotter, okay. But what does some of these have in common? They're in the lane. So my suggestion is if we continue training as many spotters as we possibly can, we make sure that they, they have the avenue which to report. I, if they're any cop or fireman, they've got their amateur radio license, and they're in a position from their own homes Southern Polk County to report the fact that tornado just came through in an area in which radar does not indicate a tornado Again, the information goes to the weather service, the information goes from us to the warning to the media, and they hopefully are willing to take our word for it downstream from that location. So that's the first thing. Second thing from a spotter's perspective, I said it earlier and I'm going to repeat. Often we will get these events that look ambiguous, and again, this, this is May 8, 2009, they look ambiguous, but we had many cells produce similar tornadoes on this same day. So we've got a day in which we have a tornado touchdown from this type of a system, the environment's right, radar doesn't look that much, but the environment's right, and what we're asking is take our word for it, start spotting, because if one storm produced a tornado, there's a, a dramatic increase in the chances for other cells to produce tornadoes in these same days. Patty, I'm going to ask you the very first question. Is this the type of stuff that you want to be talking about? Yes. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Do you all understand how, 
how, what the challenge would be like to put this in spotter training? Yeah. Okay. Would you be in, in, even, even in the beginner, would you be coming in? Yeah, I know that you have to let it explain the course, it seems like, because like this stuff, this is what we see 90% of the time, not the I, very big job on stuff. You know I, I, mean? I can show this series of slides and say, guys, there's nothing I can do to train you that can recognize these situations. Other, other than the fact that you wish there's one eight or one, have trust in us and report it again. I agree with that. I agree with that. I, I don't know as a trainer, I want to spend a lot of time putting that information out as opposed to spending time on getting the spotter in a position associated with super cell, in which they can, much like El Reno, get to the cell and, and then try to figure out what's going on. Because really, there's nothing I can do to train anybody in this room. Some of you guys have a lot of experience, do There's nothing I can do to train anybody in this room to anticipate a tornado. Well, maybe two, three minutes before it occurs. So, I would like to spend that time, but I'd have to make it three, maybe four hours. We just talked about it for an hour, these two, these two aspects. So, I would love to be able to, to provide some additional feedback to y'all, other than, just trust us. So, you said it's what you want. What, what would you all consider to be stuff that you're not getting in spotter training, but is important when it comes to when you spot? That we're not teaching. How to see bio rotation at night. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> um, the if, if, if you did start training this year, you saw that I did put one clip in there. The clip I need to put in there is from uh, January 7th in Willard. Y'all saw that video? It's like a 15-minute like video. Storm sirens go off, lots of lightning. But what, what, what are the two things that you said you have to have before you report a tornado? The two phenomena? Uh, rotation and debris, the power flashes aren't a bad one. That day, you, you didn't have it. You couldn't separate the lightning flashes from power flashes, or you couldn't see debris, you couldn't see rotation. But you could see this this phenomenon. Again, this is a long lasting video. Turn off these stuff. Oh, hey, this SLC is there. 100% agree, but from a spotting perspective, it's almost similar to this. Trust us when we use you more in that regard. Let the things come go through, and then go out and figure out what it's going to be. Okay? You've got to tell enough about changing. Abrupt change window. Um, we, we probably could do a little better job with that with the RFD in mind in particular. Yes. Strong south wind blowing into the storm. So I'm watching my supercell. I'm ready to the right. Up here after the left. Strong wind blowing through me into that wall cloud. And all of a sudden, cold air hits me from the back. What is that? That's the RFD. Okay. Now that's not to say that that RFD doesn't curl into that wall fire. <laughs> Maybe that tornado can still be present, but that knowledge might allow you to let spotters know the things. Hey, watch this thing, but if it dissipates, maybe you're going to get a different tornado touchdown with its knees. That green spray gets up. That curl the right cut off, new storm. What else should we be training? Season. Uh, let's see. Hope County's coming up <coughs> next week. Webster's Monday. Webster's I think Webster's Hulk Monday. is the following week. Okay. Oh, 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 let's back up here. I, I wish I had my schedule in front Let's make sure everybody has these dates in mind. We haven't been to training. Does anybody have to connect? And... <laughs> I 
Polk County is March 30th. Community room at the hospital? Yes, it's normal. Okay. Uh, you got what? Yeah, we moved back to the hospital where it used to be. Webster County State. Again, I, I wish I had all these. Guys, it, I'm not, I don't want to spend your time. You know, It's on our web page. Go to weather.gov, Frank Springfield, spot a training links at the top. But we got training coming up in Ozark County, Douglas County, Polk County, Webster County, Berry County. Uh, we don't have anything for Lawrence or Dallas. Da Dallas, we need to get to in the fall. Right. Uh, we don't have anything. We have interest, but we don't have a date scheduled in Wright County. Um, and then you start to go off to the more more County, and, then, and that's about it. So we've got some additional training opportunities. I'm going to get go back to that comment spotter training. I hate to call it spotter training, to be honest, but it does a very good job of looking at clouds and defining. It doesn't give you an opportunity to, to talk about communications. And I don't care how good the training is. If it doesn't help for communication, it's not spot of training in my eyes. But you've got to be hooked up locally to be a spot. For two reasons. Number one, I want you to get your information in a manner in which I can trust and rely upon. Number two, I want to be able to talk back to you to be safe. So go back to the lane. Okay? Um, if there are elements of spotter training that you do not believe are in the nighttime spotting as an example, aren't in the training, we might be able to do some, some computer based type stuff. I don't know what that might look like. But but you know, get information into your emergency management director or get information into Patty or, or other net controls, ultimately to Jim. Um, you know, get it directly to me. My email is c.runmels at noah.gov. Um, I would like to make the training work for everybody. I am, however, always looking at the fact that about half the class is new, and a third of half the class is new in every single class we teach. And I've only got resources to teach one class at a time. Sprinkle me with this particular course. I'm going to speak. <laughs> uh, now Patty said I can go to midnight, but when it comes down to it, uh, that's all the material I have here with me. Uh, you know, I, I would like to entertain if you all are interested to do this annually. You know, is, is there an opportunity maybe to do one offer, perhaps? Um, I would like to. to I, I actually would love for one of you all to be up here talking about the storm system that you dealt with on March the 9th. Uh, so I can learn from you what it is that you're seeing. Much like we saw that guy in the El Reno video. You know, here's the clouds, here's the radar. I need that feedback to further improve the training. Okay? I gotta learn from you. Now, some of you guys, you know, we used to have an opportunity to talk a little more, some of you I chased with. But when it comes down to it, I don't chase any longer. Uh, um, maybe, for a reason. Maybe, <laughs> throw this out there. maybe in the fall we can see what happens this spring okay. and plan for doing that for some storms that come through this year. Now, what do you suggest? Maybe, maybe we should do what? Ha get together and have that kind of thing. Okay. Um, would you guys, and I don't, I don't put the case with you. You're going to come up here and you're going to talk. But do you think there would be uh, uh, enough spotters who would be willing to get up in front of the audience and talk through this situation? And I don't know if it's come from this club, I don't know if it comes from the Bodar Fire Department, or from Iowa Patrol, or somebody. But I, I, That's I like what I'm saying, idea. Forum, because uh, there are a number of sources out there. It's not just the amateur radio community, <coughs> but you've got law enforcement, you've got fire departments, you've got others that information disseminates from. What I would like to also add to that is the information that allows situational awareness to increase. What does that spot know at any given time? Like, you mentioned a number of different we got camps, we got fire, we got police, we got private citizens. We don't have any other way to communicate. But does that spotter in the path of that supercell have access to all of that information? 
what are we doing? Forgive me, training our, our, our net controllers to, to collect that information and be a two-way conduit. I think sometimes some, some of, sometimes events work extremely well. I think some some events go crap. But I think it's, it, there, is, there are things that we can learn together and learn from both ends to further make our stuff safe. That's one of the things I'm Okay? Any other, anything else while, while I'm here tonight? Can you explain? Now oh, you already asked your question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you explain why um, the rain occurred? Here. <laughs> no Why did it focus on my house? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not disconnect that laptop. I'd be running through the door right now. Here's, here's the thing. This last weekend, I was working with. So I'm very personally in tune with this situation. Uh, we had, what was the forecast Sunday? There's a chance of rain. Chance, chance of rain, chance. But, but if storms develop, what was the threat? Small, small hail. Small hail, okay. yeah. The environment was such that we could see um, some pretty good lapse rates. Uh, uh, air, uh, the, the atmosphere cooling the pipe as a, as a big upper level low went into Arkansas. We are on the northern side of that building. So we're anticipating coming. We're anticipating some will push on maybe severe. Yeah, we had the storm pop up the south side of the city. I issued a thunderstorm. I have a significant weather advisory indicating nickel size hail, and I upgraded that to a warning. We got quarter size hail. Then we have a storm, and actually a better storm pop up near Miller. That's north of Chesapeake, north of the Miller area. Big storm. Strong uptrend. Should have produced something. Did produce something. Didn't get any kind of reports. I start looking to, to, the, to the south, Shell Knob area. Uh, another storm starts to pop up down there. My situational awareness was on severe weather. We had one of our staff members get up, and I'll tell you what he did. He did something. And then he came back to the operations area as he passed, and he says, Do you think I'm just going to flash from one? I said, <laughs> What? <laughs> ah! That, that cell was cells just on set. 20 minutes later, same staff member. Hey, you tell me I'm just going to flash from an emergency? Why? Oh, situational awareness. I'm thinking about severe weather, not about flood. Right? Basically, in that situation, if you have an upper low going south into, into uh, Arkansas, some degree of wrap around, such that you had a shear zone in the atmosphere that led to the updrafts, widespread upper, um, uh, upper motion, and at the same time, convergence of moisture leading to the thunderstorm. And then just east of Springfield, in Horrible area of the city. You just had an area of rotation that led to the thunderstorm at the same Yes, the six inches that we had in the area was an About an hour and a half. Yes, yes, I know. I didn't know that it was six inches, but I was kind of aware on the back side of the downtown airport, the people are. And there is a drainage ditch at the end of my road. I've seen it within maybe six inches of the road. I've never seen it on the floor on the road. One side was two inches from the road, and the other side was on the floor. If you have access to the Springfield School District rain gauge network, pull up for that event. We talk about no rainfall in the southeast, well, tenth of an inch in the southeast. We had a uh, third of an inch at the airport. I live behind the Walmart on the southwest side of the city. I may have had a half inch of it. Uh, Campbell Weaver had about an inch. And as you got into the area of uh, scenic and sunshine, an inch and a half, two inches, and even the north and even the northeast of there, you had that area of three to six inches of rain. How do you predict that you did? But what I would what I, what like to say, we've heard this from Springfield Parliament. We issued the warning. This is out of the blue. Put it out of the blue. The call went out to Swift Water Rescue Teams. We issued an emergency without any reports coming in. <coughs> the chief made the call for the usual. Right? 
That's when you know that you've got it. Your situational awareness. I don't know why it's happening. I really don't care why it's happening, but it's happening. Okay? Again, I don't know why it's happening, but it's happening. What am I going to do about it? That's a weather regulation thing. You've got to get past this job from thing where people seek out mission. From a spotter perspective, again, I really don't want you to just be too concerned with why it's happening. Okay, I'm going to have some additional information. My all of my hands. Ultimately, if I tell you that polygon is going into this area, please trust us. Keep an eye on it. I think I get on this time. So, guys, thank you very much for everything that you do. Thank you so much, Steve.